So we're going to look at a few synoptic style questions based around electricity, but they're going to be bringing in concepts from other topics as well. So we're going to start off with a bike light dynamo. So the way this works is there's a little generator attached to the bike wheel. So as the bike wheel spins, it spins the generator and that uh, powers a light that on, in this case, on the front and the back. So that's generally how a dynamo works, but we're going to use it as an analogy for an electric circuit. OK, so uh, we're going to first think about the bike or cyclist bike system. So the energy transfer occurring in that system is you've got a cyclist who is providing chemical potential energy from the form of food. And the output of the system is going to be light energy from the light bulb, but we're also going to be generating heat as well as we do work against friction, against air resistance and also, I guess, by resistance in our electric circuit, too. So we can represent the whole system just using a circuit, because remember, a cell provides chemical potential energy and a resistor transfers that into thermal energy and a light bulb transfers into light energy. Uh, so this circuit is a very nice analogy for a cyclist. So if the cyclist applies a larger force to the pedals, describe how the system has changed when they reach a higher constant speed. So. If the cyclists are providing a larger force to the pedals, they're going to be providing more power to the system or they're going to be doing more work per second. And therefore, the rate at which thermal and light energy are produced increases. So that's really what we need to talk about here. We wouldn't describe the thermal energy as getting bigger or the light energy getting bigger. It's the rate at which they are produced is going to increase. And in terms of what you'd see happening, you'd see the bike wheel spinning faster. Uh, and because the cyclist is moving uh, faster, the actual force of air resistance is going to increase. And that's why they reach a new higher constant speed, because uh, that the air resistance is going to balance the force the cyclist is providing. But that you'd see the bike wheel spinning faster or the cycle moving faster. OK, so. Next question, a little bit more challenging. Does any energy get transferred to the bike wheel when a cyclist is pedaling at constant speed? And I'm going to get, explain the reason for that. Uh, so I'm actually going to look at this at a molecular level and think about what's actually happening in the bike wheel when you apply a force. So we're applying an external force. We, the cyclist, are applying force that force to the wheel. And the way I think about it is if we just go back to what we had there. So initially, we need to start the whole system moving. So you saw in the diagram that initially the first particle moved closer to the next one, which then moved closer to the next one, which moved closer to the next one. But very quickly, what happens is you reach this kind of, we call it a dynamic equilibrium. So it's moving, but we've reached a kind of equilibrium state. So although initially we were moving particles closer together and then they were moving further apart, so we were storing electric potential energy, in the end, we we're actually not storing any energy or transferring any energy to the particles in our system. We're putting in energy at the start, we're taking energy out uh, using all the forces of friction, air resistance, using the light bulb, but actually, in the end, we don't actually transfer any energy to our actual particles of our system. So then, moving on to the next question, does any energy get transferred to the electrons in a circuit when they're traveling around at constant velocity? Well, we can think of this exactly the same way. Initially, yes, we are. In the very the first fractions of a second, yes, we do. But they very quickly reach this dynamic equilibrium where actually we're not transferring any energy to the electrons. We're putting energy into our system using a power source or an EMF, and we're taking energy out of our system using resistors, using light bulbs. But actually, in the end, the system's energy or the electrons themselves as energy isn't changing at all. And that's why those two uh, have a nice analogy to each other. OK, so let's have a look at a completely different example that gets at the same idea. So 
First of all, we're going to draw a force diagram for a free faller at constant or terminal velocity. Uh, so we get this system. So the weight force downwards is going to be equal to the force of air resistance upwards at constant velocity. So what energy transfer is occurring here? Well, we're taking gravitational potential energy. Remember, they're falling, so they're losing gravitational potential energy. And we're transferring it into thermal energy or heat. And so this is very much, again, similar to what's happening in a circuit. Initially, what happens is the gravitational potential energy is transferred into kinetic energy and they increase in their speed. But eventually you reach this constant velocity and then the energy transfer changes. So how does the magnitude of the constant velocity change if the free faller is on Jupiter with a stronger gravitational field? Uh, so for the purposes of this question, I'm assuming the atmospheres are pretty much the same, which may or may not be a valid assumption. I don't know. So if the force of the gravity or the weight force is stronger, that's going to mean that you're going to need air resistance to be bigger to balance the weight force. So in order to achieve that, the free faller would travel at higher speed uh, for those two forces to balance. And that again is the same, the kind of the same thing as increasing the EMF source. So a larger EMF provides a larger pressure. We don't usually talk about force so much in a circuit. We kind of talk about pressure because it's spread over an area. Uh, so an EMF provides a larger pressure to push electrons around the circuit. So for, to reach a dynamic equilibrium like a circuit does, the electrons have to move at higher speed for the forces to balance. And the way we describe that in a circuit is we've got a larger current. Um, so that's kind of how those two systems are similar to each other. And then final one, looking at a different type of circuit. So in an alternating circuit, the current is continuously changing direction and it follows a sine wave type shape like you can see there. So what puzzles people with alternating current is they don't understand how it can move energy from one place to another because it seems like well it's moving electrons a little bit one way then it's moving them back and then electrons aren't actually moving anywhere or they have no net movement so to understand what's going on we're going to bring in a concept for another topic we've already looked at longitudinal waves and we're going to model what's going on in a circuit as a longitudinal wave to help us understand that so uh, first of all uh, if we look at what a longitudinal wave looks like we get uh, these regions of compressions and regions of rarefaction as we oscillate the particles backwards and forwards by providing some sort of external force so in this diagram we're moving the sound the sound wave is progressing from left to right, but the particles are just oscillating backwards and forwards. The particles aren't actually going anywhere. So that's how we describe it. The particles oscillate parallel, but the particles will be oscillating left and right, but not actually going anywhere. So how is energy transferred? Well, the particles collide, transferring energy from one particle to the next. So even though the particles don't move, energy is moved and that's what's happening in an alternating kind of circuit. Uh